Norikas? Here. Wes Ryan has excused. Uh, Roger Sprague? Here. Susan Walke? Here. Kip Ward? Here. And let's rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Thank you so much. Uh, we are at consent agenda, none. Council deliberations, none. Comments from citizens present on agenda, non agenda items. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to bring to the council's attention any item not listed on the agenda for public hearing or public comment. Comments are limited to five minutes per citizen, and the city recorder will use the light system. Speakers may not yield their times to others, and as a general rule, this is not a time for exchange of questions. At the conclusion of this agenda item, a counselor may discuss or raise questions regarding an item presented by a citizen. The mayor has the authority to reduce the time allowed for comment in accordance with the number of persons present and signed up to speak. I don't have a sign-up sheet. Sandy Gruber. Good evening. Uh, my name is Sandy Gruber and I live in Lincoln City. And I am representing the Lincoln City 50th Anniversary Committee once again. And I'm here primarily to report on the parade and say thanks about the parade. Um, it went off. I was petrified um, for a few weeks leading up to the parade. Just, we haven't done it, and I knew our police had been working really hard with our street screws on getting everything organized for safety and keeping traffic flowing and, and just making it safe for all the citizens who were watching or in the parade. And they did a bang up job. And from everything I've heard, I, I kind of sort of saw the parade, but um, didn't really see it. But I heard it was great and um, for the viewers and for the people in the parade. And I really think that the vast majority of that thanks should go to our police department for their preparation, for our street crew who did fantastic preparation, and to uh, Vicki and Tony Ames and their family slash friends who helped with sending the parade out on its way and keeping the cultural center parking lot in order. Without those three groups, I'm not sure how it would have happened, but as it was, it came off in such a way that people were just giddy after, um, after it was over. And I don't blame them because when I was out early, early in the morning, I started seeing so um, um, Chairs set out on the sidewalk ready for people to watch the parade starting around 7 a.m. And that says a lot to how much people were eager to see this. And they cheered and they had a great time. And the picnic following the parade, if it weren't for Robin Heating um, and all of their crew taking over the, the food end of it, I'm not quite sure where we would have gone with that. But they were fantastic, served almost 700 hot dogs, so we had quite a crowd there. Um, everybody had a great time with the games and the music and just hanging out for a while after the parade and keeping the energy up. And after having said all that, I want to thank the city for providing some funds to the 50th Anniversary Committee for putting this parade on and making sure that we had what we needed to make it safe and fun for everyone who participated. And that's what I want to say. Well, I'm going to say terrific. It was it was an amazing feat to watch from the inside. So Thank well you. done. Well, no cars hit anybody, so that was great. Right. <laughs> yes. I um, had the opportunity to be part of the parade and um, opted out, and I really enjoyed watching it. Uh, I went horse yelling. <laughs> um, it was was wonderful. I just wanted to point out something that I noticed in Friday's paper. Um, there was a headline, Parade Brings Traffic to a Stop. And I wanted to make it clear that traffic was not stopped. Traffic kept flowing. 
Traffic kept flowing, and from what I hear, there was not a single phone call to dispatch regarding traffic on that day. Cool. So, oh, so congratulations to you guys for supporting the effort and to everyone who participated in putting it together because it really does take a community to make that work. So, so thank are you, you all. are you doing it again next year, Sam? <laughs> That's what everyone think, wants to know. I think I'm looking for a new job and moving out of town. It <laughs> be a long way, no. <laughs> Um, that is for all a uh, group decision. So September is a tough month. It's a busy, busy month, and it's kind of hard not to step on other people's toes with what's going on. But with that said, it was successful, and so I can't see any reason why ODOT would not issue a permit again. And they did not receive any calls um, or complaints about traffic. So, yeah, it was it. It came off nicely, and just. I wanted to say thank you for all the support. I think I must have been the only one person from Lincoln City who was out of town, so I missed it. I would really like to have seen it, and everything I've heard about it has been top-notch. It was recorded, and um, there is a video out on Facebook, but there's also um, a few copies floating around, and I do believe that uh, the Bijou Theater is going to be showing it at some point. Cool. Um, just to invite people to come. I think we'll get a couple copies to some of the senior living areas where those people might be able to meet and be able to watch it if they didn't get to also. Good. So. All right. Thank you, Sandy. <clears throat> Mr. Warner. Mayor and Council, my name is Jerry Warner. I live at 12. Recently elected City Councilor Jim Davis moved out of his ward, which leaves about three plus years of his term left. Normally, a council would only adopt a member if there was appointment, excuse me, appointed member if there was one year or left. Now the City Council voters to decide by the democratic process who will fill that position. Even the governor will run for election for the next two years. Roger Sprague said it would cost three to five thousand for an election. According to the county, it would cost between five hundred. This is not a justification for an appointment. He also stated that a special election could be done in 60 days. We all know why you want to do the appointment. If you want to talk about city spending waste, $25,000 hearing study on Harbor Street that was totally disregarded, 50000 on a BRD study that was disregarded, $109,000 in outside legal help on the annexation, $10,000 of legal fee derailing a lawsuit against the VCB director, $147,000 on the D River undergrounding utility. And it's just amazing. This project will probably never, never get done because it, it's going to be extremely expensive and probably will run easily two and a half to three million dollars. The city has spent over Ten million dollars on properties and improvements, and has never gone to the public to ask whether or not to approve any of these projects they've done. And anyway, think about it: that ten million dollars is now off of the tax rolls. Other items, in my opinion, Councilman Chester Norikis violated his office after 5.04 for over nine years and four months by not having a business license and was never fined a dime. By 2012, other people have received 52 citations for OTPs with a total of $10,120 in fines and penalties. Hope you can understand. Kip Ward, who lives on Widow Creek, has misled the county in or running for council by claiming a Lincoln City residence. This will probably be settled in court. We all know what the charter says. 
<clears throat> Roger Spade kept insulting Mayor Adams, uh, Williams, excuse me, in saying that he bought the election. Whereas there is a lot of us in this community that donated to his campaign and voted for Mr. Williams. Hey, Jerry. I'm going to kind of pull you up on these if I can. I, I, I appreciate what you're doing. And I, I, okay. It, well, I'm just, my last statement right. is we, the people out there, feel insulted by his statements. The city manager and the city attorney have been totally ignored these violations, and so has the city council. I think this is a disgrace to this community, and the council lacks integrity for not standing up and doing something about it. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, anyone who didn't sign up like to come up and speak? None. All right. Um, but da, 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 da. Public hearings, public comment, none. Are we at this point or is it after I read the ordinance section? Oh, come on. I would like to request that we have an executive session during today's meeting. Um, and the process for doing that is outlined in the general man, uh, manual. Uh, an executive session may be called during a regular meeting for which notice has already been given. And of course, this is a regularly advertised meeting. Uh, and then it simply says you must announce the statutory authority for going into an executive session under 192662. And this will be subsection 2H and 2F. And so I just ask at this point that under the heading city attorney, you add executive session. If we could have under K? Yeah, if we could just have a motion to that effect and to, or by unanimous consent, I'd like to just make it clear that I'd like to have an executive session to talk. And this is potent, this is current litigation. Uh, just, I talked to outside counsel today and he'd like to. Um, okay. Have me touch base with you. So. All right. Thank you. Okay, so we're at ordinances. Uh, ordinance 201510, second reading, an ordinance amending the Lincoln City Municipal Code, Title I, General Provisions, Chapter 1.16, Civil Infractions, and Chapter 1.2, Ordinance Enforcement to consolidate and update code enforcement chapters and make changes consistent with LCMC, Chapter 9.04, amending violation classifications to be consistent with state law, amending Chapter 1.04 to change the default violation from Class A to Class B, amending the code to change civil infractions to violation consistent with current terminology. We're not picking you up, sir. I'm not hearing you. Your Honor, this item was on the agenda at the meeting. However, it did not dated materials. It's, it's off again. <clears throat> Um, this item was on the last agenda. However, the agenda packet did not contain the updated materials. So I included uh, those materials in this packet, and I showed in highlighting the suggested changes that were offered uh, by the police chief. And I, I made the change that uh, Councillor Walkie had pointed out at the last meeting. Um, and so those changes are reflected. And with your permission, I will read those changes. Um, and then if you would like to, I will conduct the second reading. And you could make a motion to approve it with the changes as read. Unless, if you don't want me to read those changes, tell me now. OK. So uh, the, the change that Councillor Walkie made that I, I actually made in the ordinance that's attached is uh, Section D, the municipal court is bound by the minimum fine provisions of ORS 153-021 as it relates to Class A through D violation offenses. Uh, that's, that's how it reads now with the extra words deleted. Um, also, the police chief had recommended that the definition of city enforcement officer or enforcement officer be modified as follows. It will now read, means for purposes of this chapter, any one or more of the following personnel, city manager, city attorney, code enforcement officer, VRD compliance officer, city engineer, building official, 
building inspector, any sworn member of the Lincoln City Police Department, or any city employee, contractor, or agent designated by the city manager in writing to perform code enforcement. Also, in section 116.040, under enforcement authority, um, about halfway through that section, uh, the language is modified as follows. Um, so, let's see. On line nine, beginning with notwithstanding the above, a city enforcement officer is expressly authorized by law to issue a citation to a person for a violation created by city ordinance if the city enforcement officer personally witnesses the violation or has probable cause to believe that the person has committed a city ordinance offense. If the person, if the person to be issued a citation is a firm corporation or any other organization, issuance of a citation to any city employee agent, I'm sorry, to any employee agent or representative thereof shall be sufficient to confer jurisdiction upon the municipal court. And the remainder of that section remains unchanged. Now, I did find another problem with the ordinance this morning, and that is in section 116.070. And although it's Address later on, I'll just mention that in 116.070, where it says maximum, it uses it says Class A infraction, $2,000, Class B infraction, $1,000, Class C infraction, $500, Class D, $250, and also uh, E and F are also. The point is the word infraction is used, and later on in the ordinance it says all Everywhere the word infraction is used, it needs to be changed to violation. So I neglected to make that change. I'm just pointing out that the instruction later on to change infraction to violation will change that section. With that, that's, that's the changes that were called out. Um, this is the second reading of Ordinance 2015-10. An ordinance amending the Lincoln City Municipal Code, Title I, General Provisions, Chapter 1.16, Civil Infractions, and Chapter 1.20, Ordinance Enforcement, to consolidate and update code enforcement chapters and make changes consistent with LCMC Chapter 9.04, amending violation classifications to be consistent with state law, amending Chapter 1.04 to change the default violation from Class A to Class B, amending the code to change civil infraction to violation consistent with current terminology. So we're looking for a motion to approve second reading and adopt the ordinance with the changes as read. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Please, Mr. Mayor. A couple of weeks ago, I read the uh, background, in, background information that we received regarding this ordinance, and I'd like to uh, read that again for the benefit of the public, if I may. 2014, the City Council started the process of updating code enforcement provisions of the code with the adoption of ordinances 2014-01 and 2014-03. Ordinances adopted current state criminal law procedures and made them applicable to municipal court. Ordinance 2014-01 also included the adoption of ORS Chapter 153 violation provisions and applied them to all violations within the jurisdiction of the municipal court. The ORS chapter was substantially rewritten in 1989. City code provisions concerning violations date to 1983 and 1987. This amendment updates and conforms the code and removes dated inconsistent provisions. Classifications are made consistent with state law. However, two additional classifications are added. All Class A violations are amended to be Class B until such time as Council desires to reclassify offenses. As noted, additional work will be necessary, i.e., Council will need to apply classification of offenses and will be brought forward in subsequent ordinances. Council approved first reading of the ordinance on August 24, 20, August, August 24, 2015. Second reading was set for September 14, 2015, with receipt of written, written comments authorized until noon on September 9, 2015. No comments were received. 
On September 14, 2015, the second reading was continued until September 28, 2015, with receipt of written comments authorized until noon on September 23, 2015. No comments were received. I would also like to from, read from the ordinance regarding the purpose of uh, this chapter, chapter 1.16. The purpose of this chapter is to provide a convenient and practical forum for a civil hearing and determination of cases arising out of violations of city ordinances. And I believe this ordinance will assist staff in fairly and accurately applying the code enforcement chapters of our municipal code. Thank you. Any further discussion, Mr. Mayor? Sir. Um, Mr. Hello. Um, for the, now, the way I'm reading this, a uh, uh, police officer could write a, a civil citation. Is that correct? Yes, any police officer uh, under under this uh, ordinance is authorized to issue a violation citation. So are, are they schooled in that? Is it something that they would know how to do? I, I believe uh, more than anyone else in the building, probably police officers are uh, very well trained at issuing citations. They issue violation citations all the time, mostly for traffic. Right but uh, also for things like minor in possession and things like that. So they're all trained, and a lot of the amendment here has been geared toward syncing up their training with our, or, or syncing our ordinance with their training. So, for example, um, uh, now the officers, if they say it's a Class A violation, uh, and right now you won't have any Class A violations because everything's a B, um, yeah, but if something's an A, they know that's a $2,000 fine with a designated uh, presumptive fine that's less than that. Um, if you, you say it's a Class B violation, they know under state law that's a $1,000 fine. Um, and they don't have to remember that, as it is right now, in the city a Class A violation is a $1,000 fine. So we've, we've made them consistent so they don't have to remember city fine amount, state fine amount. Um, and that's the reason to maintain the status quo. We've changed all the Class A's to Class B, so the fine amount is still $1,000. It's just a Class B. But it gives you room if you decide something is more serious. You can label something in the future. This is a policy decision for you. You can make something a Class A. But right now, everything will be a Class B, $1,000 fine. Okay, one, one more quick question. I was noticing that if a person didn't pay their ticket, then the city will be filing a, a lien against their property. Is that right? That was on um, one uh, one sixteen one six zero delinquent forfeitures liens. That's a provision in the existing ordinance. It's only, I mean, it's hardly modified at all. Yes. Okay, so I guess my question was, do we have a, a process for once they paid their ticket to uh, register satisf satisfaction of that lien? Yes, I'm not actually sure that we're actually filing liens right now, but we do have a process uh, to file satisfactions when people satisfy their liens, yes. Okay, that's all my question. Thank you. Further discussion? Okay. All on that? Sprague? Yes. Walkie? Yes. Ward? Yes. Williams? Yes. Norakis? Yes. And Ryan? Oh, I'm sorry, he's not here. Motion carries. All right. Uh, resolutions none. Special order of business presentation Americans with Disability Act. Kevin Matias? 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 Matias. Matias, thank you. Stephanie. 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 Remember, both of you speak into the mic. Yes, we will do. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Tonight, we'd like to give you an update on the city's ADA, American with Disabilities Act um, program, and remind you that um, 
in July 2014, the City Council approved a new position to be added to the City, a part-time ADA coordinator. The purpose of that position is and was to facilitate the City's commitment to maintaining ADA compliance and um, also to create an accessible destination for people with disabilities. So then in March of 2015, we hired our ADA coordinator, Kevin Mateus. So I'm going to introduce um, a little bit, give you a little bit of background about Kevin, and then he's going to talk about our program. So Kevin comes to us. Um, he has a master's degree in therapeutic recreation from Minnesota State University. He uh, first started working in the field with seniors and mental health issues. Before he came to work for Lincoln City, he worked for the City of Portland Parks and Recreation Department, and he was their inclusion services coordinator. Kevin has a lot of knowledge on the ADA. He's really hit the ground running. And tonight, again, he's going to talk about how the city stands, where we are within our compliance, and what the next steps are. Kevin? Thank you, Stephanie. Again, my name is Kevin Mateus, and I've been with the city since March of this year. Um, I'm here tonight to talk about the Americans with Disabilities Act, or otherwise known as the ADA. Um, I want to kind of give you a little background on it, and we'll kind of talk about what it implies for the city of Lincoln City. So the <clears throat> ADA was signed into law in July of 1990, which makes this the 25th anniversary of it. Um, it's basically a civil rights bill that enables people with disabilities the opportunity to be able to participate in all the activities that are offered to the rest of the community. Um, so one of the important goals of the law is to ensure that all individuals with disabilities are able to access public programs and services. And so as a local government, the Lincoln City is required to abide by Title II of the ADA. And what we're required to do is designate a reasonable, responsible employee to coordinate ADA compliance, provide notice of ADA requirements, establish a grievance procedures, conduct a self-evaluation, and develop a transition plan. So let me talk a little about, a bit about those. Um, so the city has been providing an ADA coordinator before I showed up. It was Stephanie, as well as the former uh, HR uh, employee or HR department person. But due to their workload, they were not able to focus as much time as the ADA required of them. So uh, the position was advertised, and I saw it and applied for it, and I was very grateful being a uh, uh, pick to be the ADA coordinator here. So as the ADA coordinator, um, I have a lot of different responsibilities. One is to uh, write our transition plan. And I'll go into more detail about that later. Uh, another one of my responsibilities is to uh, review new construction plans that the city is proposing. Uh, my job is to kind of look over it, make sure that <clears throat> where we're going to design sidewalks or curb ramps or, or parking lots, that we're meeting, meeting all the ADA requirements. I'm not a building code enforcement officer. I just make sure that we are meeting everything that's required by the ADA. So everything that is built from now on um, should be able to meet every requirement that is out there. There might be times due to uh, the topography of the city that we might not be able to meet every requirement, at which point um, I will consult with uh, experts in the field, either with the Department of Justice or with um, agencies in the Pacific Northwest about how we might be able to do our best effort to meet the requirements of ADA, although we might not be able to meet them, but what we need to do to go as far as we can. Um, so there might be some, like I said, some projects in the future where we might have to uh, write a little statement saying we tried our best uh, due to circumstances. We're not able to meet everything here, but we are aware of it, and we know we're trying to do our best to make it as make it make it accessible as possible. Um, I'm also responsible for dealing with any ADA concerns that might come up. If people are 
have a, a complaint or a suggestion or a request to modify some of our policies or procedures. It would be my responsibility to address them, uh, work with the individual, and to make sure that they feel that they're being satisfied with what we are providing them in regards to the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, so that's kind of my role as a, as a coordinator. Um, other things that the city are responsible for doing is to provide notice of ADA requirements. Uh, that is on our web page. If you guys go to where it says ADA accessibility, you can click on there. There'll be a statement saying what we're required to do. There's also posters hanging up uh, in the hallway here on the third floor of City Hall stating the ADA requirements and what we're required to do. I believe there's a poster over at the community center also. Um, and again, on different aspects of our web page, we have statements stating what they do, what we're required to do by the ADA. So we have met that. Um, we need to establish a grievance procedure, which has been completed also. Uh, again, that's on our web page under ADA accommodations. If someone feels that they are not receiving fair services because of a disability, they're the a uh, form that they can fill out. It'll go to my go to myself, and again, it'll be up to me to address those grievances with the individual, uh, with the certain department within this, the city to come up with a solution so that they feel that they're being their requests are being met and their services are not being denied to them due to a disability. Um, also. With the grievance procedure, we have an appeals process. So, say they request an accommodation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so, they request an accommodation. I spoke with them. I spoke with the department here within the city, and we felt that what they're requesting is not reasonable. We could offer something else, but if they don't like what we're offering, they can appeal our decision, which would go to our community court here in Lincoln City and explain the whole process on our webpage. So, we're, again, that's everything that's required, not everything, but that's what's required by the ADA for us to do. Um, another, another thing we're required to do is conduct a self-evaluation. That was done in 2013. A contractor was brought in, or I'm sorry, a consultant was brought in to uh, evaluate all our built environment. Uh, they produced a report, which was over 10,000 pages. A very thick report. <laughs> uh, I've had the opportunity to go through that report and look at everything that's been identified as not meeting ADA standards. Um, I'm in the process of evaluating everything that was identified, putting a priority number to it, and once that's complete, well, that has been complete, I'm sorry. Um, then it's, we move on to writing a transition plan. Um, we also need to conduct a self-evaluation on our policies and practices. I've started that already by looking through our web page and some of the things that are, are published by the city of Port, or, I'm sorry, city of Lincoln City. Um, I will also provide a questionnaire to every department head within Lincoln City to make sure that they are following ADA requirements or are understanding what they need to do in case something came to them requesting accommodation. So our self-evaluation is nearly completed. And with that information, um, we need to develop a transition plan. That's going to be uh, basically explaining to the public Department of Justice that we are aware of what's out there. We know what we are lacking in ADA requirements. But we do have a plan on how to fix these things. Um, it's basically going to be talking about what are our priorities, how we want to go about doing it. Um, it's going to look at um, our built environments and our sidewalks and uh, our curb ramps. Those are three things that are very important to the transition plan. Uh, I plan to have this transition, a draft of this transition plan completed by the end of this year at which point we will present it to you, the City Council. We'll also open it up to the public for public comment. Uh, we'll, we'll decide how long a public comment period we have, and we'll take all that information in there. 
and then hopefully we'll have a final uh, transition plan to present to the city council again somewhere down the road. And then every few years, we always want to go back and revisit our transition plan, make sure we're actually following it, make sure we're reading what we said we're going to do for building sidewalks that meet ADA standards, putting in curb ramps that meet ADA standards, uh, you know, making sure our buildings are up to snuff so people can get in there and be served and feel that they are just part of the community like anyone else should be. Um, and that's kind of it for me right now. Are there any questions? Mr. Mayor? Yes, sir. The thing that got us involved in this process was a scare that we heard from somebody saying that there, there are people going around finding cities that are not in compliance and then huge fines are levied against them. So that that got us going. The question is, do we have to make periodic reports in order to stave off the, the big fines? Well, what, what we need to do is write our transition plan. So again, like say, that's saying that we are aware of these, these deficiencies, we are making a plan to correct them, and we should be out correcting them also. And like I said, every two or three years, we, might want, to re we want to revisit the transition plan saying, yes, we have met these items that we said we're going to fix within two years. And so, um, <clears throat> obviously, I'm, I'm not an attorney, but from my understanding, the Department of Justice looks at that and says, okay, we, you know, we know every community probably has ADA deficiencies, but we want to make sure people are aware of them. You're going to do something about it. If we, if we do that, they're going to go, hey, good job, Lincoln City. We're proud of you. Keep it up. And uh, hopefully we won't get any fines. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mr. Mayor. You, um, in your report, you indicated that we've added a notice to city correspondence regarding ADA requirements. Yes. Is that referring to the web page or to letters that we send out? What kind of correspondence? Well, on our web page, we, we state what's required by the ADA and how we're going about meeting it. Um, like I said, there's a poster here on the third floor hallway that talks about the ADA requirements and what we're doing. Um, and then we will. We are in the process of trying to get out statements on our correspondence. You know, saying, explaining to people how they can go about requesting accommodation or how to get uh, material in an alternative format. You know, it might be braille or it might be large print, um, but they can somehow contact us and we can go about providing the accommodation they're requesting. And this would be on a, a notice of city council meetings, for instance? Yep. Uh, there, in our notice, there's a statement asking about, um, I believe, sign language interpreters. Um, it should be like the second or third paragraph down. Talks about that. Um, so pretty much any, anything we send out will have a statement pretty soon. And, and, and have we had any grievances filed, sir? Uh, within since I've been here or yes uh, no I don't believe there's been any formal grievances I've talked to people with concerns um, I do know that there have been grievances filed prior to my employment here which I believe helped lead to this position and you were able to help the folks who came to you with issues yes, yes. we had one over at the uh, community centers a few weeks ago um, that uh, I believe they've been, they believe that they are satisfied with what has happened there. I'm glad to see that you have a draft transition plan. I appreciate that and look forward to seeing it later this year. Yes. And, and welcome aboard. Um, we appreciate your expertise and your looking over this issue that we really need to keep track of. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. All right. Construction Contract Award, Northwest 52nd Drive and Keel Avenue Storm Improvements. Stay up here for this one, and I'll start you off with the background and the project description, and then Lyle will talk about the budget and the funding. So tonight, um, we're asking for a construction contract award for the Northwest 52nd and Northwest Keel Avenue Storm Improvements. This is in Rhodes End. 
Um, the city identified, and it was really spearheaded by the homeowners um, along this area that were being affected by a lack of stormwater facilities and um, causing some flooding um, on their property and into their, bu into their building. So Public Works, um, once the annexation occurred, we took a look at this problem and we hired a consulting firm to help us design a stormwater system to serve this area. The um, design includes 1,140 feet of 12-inch storm line, uh, about another 78 feet of larger 15-inch storm line, seven catch basins, and one ditch inlet. So it's a pretty um, significant uh, stormwater project. What, we'll, what it'll do is uh, go from northwest 50th along Keel to the south to 50. I'm sorry, start at Northwest 52nd, then go along Keel to the south and drain into um, an existing storm outlet onto the beach. So we were really pressed for time um, to get this project constructed this year. And um, that's, again, why we hired consulting engineers to help us. We were planning on doing this in-house, but we... Our, we, we did get some additional resources, and we published uh, the request um, for bid in the News Guard September 16th. We did only receive one bidder. We opened bids on the 23rd. Um, the bidder, however, was a successful bidder, a well-known. We have a long history with this contractor, Devil's Lake Rock. The bid amount was $105,163.35. So our, our project budget and costs on this, um, the project was approved in the 2015-16 budget in the Street Capital Fund, and the budget was 75000 And um, if the project is approved, the remaining overage, um, because the, the actual cost with all um, items um, comes to $162,965.48. That's engineering purchasing the materials. And so our, our additional capital reserve um, will leave us a balance of approximately 90,000 um, to start the next, to move forward to the next fiscal year. And so the, the city purchased the pipe for the project at the amount of $14,352. And then um, we attached a table to show you the Bureau of Labor Industry um, fee of $250 and the consulting fee of 32700 and then the materials that um, uh, 143213 and then um, the construction bid which Stephanie mentioned of the 105163 and then we added a construction contingency of 10500 for that total of 162965 and then we um, also attached pictures of what, what we call Keel Lake, and you could drive a small car into this um, area. We, we did do um, some grading and graveling here. We've been doing that um, for some time. But just that one last short rain that we had, um, you can see in the pictures attached that um, how much water was was deposited in this one location. And so when we do have a larger rain event, it's going to, it has been flooding those houses. And so they've actually been calling us for quite a few years, even before they were annexed into the city, um, complaining about this project. And there's no easy way to drain this, you know, like taking it over the hillside and then 50th, at the end of 50th Street, which half of um, Northwest 50th was in the city limits, and then the other half on the north side was in the Roads End District in the county. And the county did not maintain either of these roads. They only maintained Logan Road. And so the roads have, have been left, and, you know, they, they um, initiated building permits without putting in these storm projects. You know, they have an open ditch down kill. But the part on 50th Street has been washing out and has been a problem for, for quite a few years as well. 
And so it's, it's just time to address this. It takes care of quite a few different problems and it'll take care of some erosion going down to the beach. There's quite a cavern um, when you get down um, to the beach access. And so this project will also put in a swell, uh, kind of a bio swell that will treat the water and keep it from eroding that um, area further and make the beach access safer. So right now you could you know, pretty much fall in that ravine, it's that big. Mr. Mayor, if I could just take a moment. Um, in anticipation of this meeting, we also discussed and thought it would be a good idea to give you a snapshot of where we are with our budget and how this affects that budget and also um, how it affects next year's budget. Um, I left on your table uh, this sheet that has its supplementary uh, street capital fund budget to 11. Um, when we adopted the budget in, in June, it included for this um, the street capital $718,065 that would be used for any overages or any additional projects that we would want that we may want to add throughout the year. Since that time, we have received an additional $327,000 that was not budgeted in revenues. Uh, 101,000 of that came from FEMA, and then our beginning fund balance was $226,000 higher than what we were projecting. Uh, we have either out to bid or in the process or completed projects that total $585,000 over our estimated or budgeted amount. That amount uh, to cover that is coming from the $718,000. In addition, we have uh, designated $370,000 to be used for street overlays uh, in, in the city. And that also is coming out of the $718,000. Plus, we're also uh, anticipating using the um, the extra revenues to cover those those two those two costs, and uh, leaving us at this point with an ending fund balance of ninety thousand dollars. Now uh, we've had some difficulty this year in that our estimates, our budget estimates, have been coming in under what the actual price is. So we're not anticipating that that ninety thousand dollars will be available. Now the original budget also did not anticipate that we would be carrying money over to next year. It was also taking it down to zero. And so one of the questions that came up um, uh, uh, in the last week or so that we wanted to address is because of the overages that we have had, are we pushing projects back next year? Are there projects that because of this we won't be able to do next year because we're using up that fund balance? And the short answer is, is no. And the reason for that is the way we have uh, in the past budgeted and spent for road improvements. Um, in the water and sewer funds, we have capital improvement plans, five-year plans that outline each year what we're going to be trying to accomplish. And then we have tried to budget to accomplish those. In the past, for roads, we just have simply designated an amount, 200, 500, 700,000, whatever that amount is, and said we will, we will upgrade the roads as far as that money takes us. And so there isn't a specific plan that says we're going to do these roads next year and then we're doing these roads the year after and so forth. So you're actually not pushing the uh, projects back. Um, and we just simply have been in the past beginning from a zero point, whatever revenues we have, that's what we, that's, that's how far we'll go on the roads. Now, uh, one of the things that came out of last year's budget that uh, Mrs. Bradley and her staff have been working on is to actually create that capital improvement uh, budget. Um, by simply budgeting, uh, we will fall short over the next 20 years of trying to identify how much we need to upgrade all of our roads. If you recall in our budget meetings, one of our plans was to redo or re overlay all the roads that we have within a 20 to 25 year period. That's still our goal, which means we're going to have to set some amounts that says this is how much it will cost us each year to do that. 
Um, so as I mentioned, the public work staff is preparing that, and that will come back to you uh, and the rest of the budget committee as part of next year's budget so that you have a capital plan to work from and you know that in year one through uh, two, three, four, five, so forth, that this is how much it will take to stay on track. So very long explanation to say that it's not pushing anything back based upon the way we have been doing our budgeting in the past, but we hope to be changing a little bit on how we've been doing that to give you more concrete projects in, in the years to come. Thank you. Is there any way that the uh, residents that live on Keel might consider a uh, what the hell I do? What do you call it? Uh, an improvement project to pave that road there, along with um, this kind of construction. Possibly in the future. This did not include. This included. Um, this did not include paving the road. It's putting I know this it storm. Didn't, but that, that, it's going to they, be they, chopped up. They might be, else. and so we're going to bring some proposals on that to you in the future as well, looking at what our policies are right now, and possibly changing some of those and. And um, looking at what we can do to get some of the gravel streets paved, and and so we could partner with them possibly. There's quite a few different things that we were planning to discuss with council will the in cost, the near future. Will the cost be less if we do that now versus waiting um, um, to come back in the future and pave I, the road? I I don't think so. It might, you know, you'll have to, all of these roads in Roads End have been graded and graveled to the point that, you know, you could actually overlay all of them because the road base is there right now. And so over time that will deteriorate a little bit. So you would have to go back and add more more gravel to that. I'm familiar with that street, and, I, and I've seen that lake. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that, the, uh, at least I know one person that lives on that street that has shown uh, disdain about the fact right. <laughs> that they have to drive through a lake. And uh, it would just seem to me that's a good opportunity since it's going to be chopped up a little bit anyway for the construction to, to maybe do that. It, it is. Um, it's just a timing issue because to do an LID, you know how long those take us to yeah. put together. So we would be a year out just trying to get the property owners on board and, and you know, making sure that all of that goes smoothly. So this is really an emergency project is the way I'm looking at the storm issue. I mean, we're going to have, they're going to have flooding the next large rain, and so that's why we're pushing at least as part of it as fast as we can. Sure. <clears throat> Stephanie, you, you mentioned that the uh, bids went out on September 16th, did you say? Yes, we advertised on the 16th. Yeah, the memo said the 23rd, and I, I was concerned about that. That didn't seem like there was much time. But to, Well, but we advertised on the 16th, and we opened on the 23rd, and that was not a lot of time. We knew we were giving the – we were only allowing um, a week for the contractors to put together their bid. We did call a lot of them and let them know when the plan holder list wasn't growing the day after we advertised. Um, but they're very busy. I mean, that's what they told us. They were too busy to put together a bid, and they're they're busy right now. So it was really Devil's Lake Rock was the one who got the plans right away from the advertisement and and really put together a a, a bid. So we we also purchased the pipe and catch basins ahead of time, so that would help contractors bid on this project because they wouldn't have to supply the materials. But even so, we didn't have any, we had very little interest, it seems. Right. And it seems, to, it looks like we're $88,000 over budget. Correct. Yes. Did this project grow after the estimate, after you did the estimate? Uh, was there after, a, after the design. After the design. It mm -hmm. did. Yeah, there were many more catch basins and it, it was just more complicated to get the water from that location. Right. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. So um, our, our recommendation is um, 
to award the bid to Devil's Lake Rock in the amount of $105,163.35 with that contingency of 10%, $10,500. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Sprague? Yes. Walkie? Yes. Ward? Yes. Williams? And Norikas? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we are in two. Technical assistance grant, do I need to read that or letter of support? Whoops. Yes. Here in council, I, um, I thought I had written a cover memo for this and somehow it doesn't seem to have gone out in the packet. So let me start sort of from scratch. Uh, the Department of Land Conservation and Development is offering technical assistance grants to help cities update their comprehensive plans and other documents. And at the top of their list of priorities is economic development. Well, we are just about ready to start our comprehensive plan update. And one of the key components that we have not uh, done anything on in um, 10 years is the 2006 economic opportunities uh, and buildable lands assessment. So um, our representative for DLCD, our, our regional representative, uh, actually contacted us last week uh, and they're due on Wednesday, but um, he suggested that it seems to be about Lincoln City's turn to get one of these grants. And uh, after discussing with him um, our need to update this economic and buildable lands assessment, he suggested that uh, a grant of about 50000 probably would be reasonable and a match of 25% would make it competitive. So we are talking about a $50,000 grant and a match of $12,500. We have budgeted this year um, in our planning department budget and also some funds in uh, urban renewal and um, public works to do an update, uh, begin our update of the comprehensive plan. So we have money available to use as match. This is um, would cover two components that were required to include in the comprehensive plan update, uh, economics, and it addresses the statewide goal for economics and housing. So um, it seems like a really nice fit, and uh, we will do our best to turn in a good application on Wednesday. The application does require a letter of support from the mayor, or, well, from the city, and we would like to have it be from the mayor. Is this anything I need to read, or since it's in public record, it's done? I believe it's all right. Okay. Yes. Kathy's nodding. It's okay to not read it. Yes? Yes. Or should I read it? You can read it. All right. It's short. To whom it may concern, the City Council of the City of Lincoln City supports the application for funds to assist us with preparing an economic opportunities analysis and building buildable lands assessment. The City's update to our dated comprehensive plan is just underway. We need to update our 2006 economic opportunities and buildable land assessment so that we are basing our new plan on current economic information and guidance. A grant would help us in hiring the needed expertise to accomplish this work. Lincoln City is funds for the comprehensive plan update in our 2015-2016 budget. The city intends to allocate a portion of these funds as a 25% cash match for our grant request. On behalf of the city council, I thank you for making these funds available and for considering Lincoln City's application. Sincerely, Mayor Don Williams. Thank you. So do we need a motion or? Yes, please. Okay. I'm looking for a motion to accept. Just to approve your signature on this grant request. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Yes, please, Mayor. You, Mr. Mayor, uh, one, one question. You you support this uh, oh, absolutely. endeavor? Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, any discussion? Roll call on that one. That's cash, right? 
Sprague? Yes. Walkie? Yes. Ward? Yes. Williams? Yes. And Norikas? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, presentation, Natural Hazards Mitigation Plan. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I haven't been here for a while, but Mark Nicholson, Emergency Preparedness Coordinator. Um, tonight, I'm basically here just to talk to you a bit about the Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan. There's no real action uh, that we're expecting tonight. Later in October, we're hoping that, uh, that you'll agree to adopt this plan. But for now, it's, it's a discussion. Uh, of the plan, <coughs> excuse me. Um, in doing that, I'll go through a few general points about what the plan is and maybe how it fits in some context to try to try to make sense out of it. Because there's a lot of these plans that you may hear bits and pieces about to try to put that into some context. We'll talk a little more specifically about the natural hazard mitigation plan and some of the key activities um, that we've identified in the plan um, to pursue over the coming years, actually. Some are very long-term. Um, and then I was just going to summarize some of the dates to show how we got to where we are. The first uh, thing I wanted to talk about is we have a number, even uh, you know, just in the emergency preparedness area, we have a number of plans that are um, that are active, that are in the progress of being uh, developed or uh, and eventually approved. The in emergency preparedness, we usually break down the cycle of preparedness and response into. Into four, thanks. Into four, uh, four areas: uh, mitigation, preparedness, response, recovery, and this is usually shown, shown as a circle. Um, I'm going to talk about these. I'm putting together the mitigation and preparedness part for this for this discussion. Um, then talk about response and recovery just a little bit to try to provide the context. The Natural Hazards Mitigation Plan, as, it, as the name sounds, is our primary tool for identifying those things that we can uh, that we can tackle that will lessen the loss of life and property damage during a disaster. So it's sort of forward-looking. I think of the Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan <clears throat> more or less like a master plan. You know, there's identifying the big issues. That, uh, that we need to deal with over time. It's not a budget, and it's not, uh, there's no real dollar signs associated with it, but these activities would be found in, for example, public works budget or elsewhere. The purpose of the plan is kind of to identify them and, and, and put some priorities with them. In the response area, once we're actually responding to a disaster, the emergency operation plan is the standard document uh, that we would use. And this might define things like communication protocols, who does what when to notify the public, evacuation and how that works, and the various players in the, in the, in the arena and what their roles are. In the recovery phase, a continuity of operations plan or COOP plan is um, is something that guides us to say if after a major disaster what needs to be working today, next week, 
two weeks to get some sort of plan to recovery. And ideally to think through that plan enough that um, that recovery is shortened. And businesses should have such a plan and we should all as individuals have such plans as well. And there's what do we, not just how do we survive, but then how do we pick up the pieces and move forward. And that's basically what a continuity of operations plan. Today we're talking about natural hazard mitigation. <clears throat> In the coming months, you will receive an updated copy of the emergency operations plan and ultimately early next year, hopefully uh, uh, that can be adopted. And next year we will be upgrading the continuity of operations plan just to give you some perspective of where we're headed here. Underlying these are the actual day-to-day -day activities, and I didn't try to, to, to list a work plan, um, such as outreach, training. We have a lot of training that we do both uh, in-house and outside in emergency management. Um, infrastructure development. Uh, Tony Lasoya is going to talk a bit about uh, infrastructure development with respect to IT. That's a critical part of of this of this area as well. In other words, especially if you think of continuity of operations, you can only bring services back if we have functioning IT. But that's true also in response, and uh, and it's it, it, it's a critical area. So I didn't try to list those activities, but there's an underlying number of activities. Some take place in public works. For example, one of the mitigation activities that was identified um, a few years ago was increasing the size of culverts in certain locations. I mean, it's basically a stormwater uh, improvement. So that, you know, you would see that in the public works budget as an operational budget. So at this level, at the National Hazard Mitigation, it's more just to identify those and then try to make sure we get, we incorporate them. Throughout these plans, since Kevin was just here, I just wanted to mention, throughout these plans, <clears throat> we want to focus on making sure we're keeping in mind the ADA compliance issues. This has been an issue in some parts of the country where people didn't factor those things in. When it comes to evacuation, it's a fairly complicated uh, uh, situation. So we try to, to make sure we're thinking about that. Along those lines, we recently had a, a very productive workshop uh, with also with Gail at the community center, but where we talked about sheltering and we got together experts, local uh, countywide experts, to talk about what special needs there might be and what we should think about um, to make sure that sheltering operation goes well and evacuation to a certain extent. As I mentioned, I just wanted to emphasize there are a lot of the, what, what we're trying to do going forward, one of the things that I think we're trying to do going forward is to try to make sure we establish the linkages of these various plans. And one obvious area is the comprehensive plan that the planning department will be undertaking this year and next year. <clears throat> there is a section of the comprehensive plan that's based basically natural hazard mitigation. So that's a clear overlap and we want to make sure we have consistency there. And that's another opportunity to get feedback from the community on what the priorities should be, are, and what we do about them. But then also we have master plans that, that link directly into these because the long-term projects, the big ones tend to be public works enhancements, whether it's, um, it, could, it could be, it's not so much for us, but it could be things like bridges and all that, though that's mainly ODOT. Um, and then there's a number of other plans. I'm not going to talk about each one of them, but these all come into play to a certain extent. Why develop this? I put this slide in here for, for one very specific reason. The, um, one of the driving reasons to develop such a plan, and that's true with a number of, of these, not just in emergency management, but throughout, is the second point, which is to meet federal requirements. It's required that we have a, an adopted functioning plan 
and that's sort of an end in and of itself. But I want to stress the first point. <laughs> this should be a valuable document as we move forward in our comprehensive uh, uh, mitigation planning or emergency management planning. So we want to stress that we're not doing this just to check the box so that we qualify for funds. We're doing this because this will help us uh, get our act together and provide the services we should be providing. I'm not saying that we're not, but we can provide better services in the, in the future. And I list a couple, the Disaster Mitigation Act of 2000. There's a number of references to, to why we do this natural hazard mitigation plan. But again, my focus is on the strategic planning aspect of it. Okay, what it is, I'll talk about this throughout, but uh, FEMA's definition of mitigation is an effort to, the effort to reduce the loss of life and property by lessening the impact of disasters, and I think that's fine. For mitigation, that's what we're, we're up against. So we're looking at things that we can do today so that when disaster strikes, we'll be better able to, one, save lives, and two, recover in a timely manner. And I mentioned, you know, uh, I mentioned the stormwater. That's a, you know, an obvious link. Uh, working on water storage and supply to try to ensure that we have um, everything in place to the extent possible, et cetera. A few comments about how this plan was developed. This is been ongoing for about a year and a half. The previous plan was adopted in 2009, and they are to be upgraded every five years. We got delayed a bit here because of FEMA's funding mechanism, but uh, but they are aware of that, and they, they, they gave us a buy, as it were. But um, this has been a collaborative effort. It's a Lincoln County plan. So you, if you were confused by that when you looked at it, it's a Lincoln County, it's just the way it works, it's a Lincoln County plan and then Lincoln City and other jurisdictions have an addendum to that that is in effect the Lincoln City Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan. But there are linkages because a number of the projects that are defined in, at the Lincoln County level are assuming in, in our conversation that we're partners in those efforts because they might take place within Lincoln City. Or, or we have uh, memoranda, memoranda of understanding. The project was directed by a steering committee that was made up of members of these various jurisdictions. Um, at the city, a number of people participated, Lila, Deb, Richard Townsend, Sandy Gruber. There's a number, number of people who were involved in various aspects of this over the last year and a half. It's been a long process. And the Oregon Partnership for Disaster Resilience is a, is a, it's not really a department, but it's a unit within the uh, University of Oregon, and they facilitated the process. A lot of these big plans come together by a consultant getting the contract to implement plans in a number of communities, and they are the ones that did this. They're very active in this area. They were also very active in working on the Oregon Resilience Plan. If you're familiar with that, it's a 50-year plan. <clears throat> so just to talk a bit about what this, you know, I don't know, four, I'm not sure if Ron counted, but there's like 400 pages or something um, of this plan. There's, uh, there's four volumes. The first is probably, is, uh, volume one is the, the basic plan, is basically what it's called. And there's an executive summary that outlines what the plan is and why do it, and, it's, and et cetera, et cetera. The second, the hazard index, um, is kind of what it sounds like. It's dealing with specific hazards in some amount of detail. I'll talk a little bit about risk assessment in a minute. And then volume three is where the Lincoln City ad, uh, addendum is, and it's where Yahats, Walport, North Lincoln Fire, Lincoln School District, et cetera, would, uh, would have ad addenda in this, in this area. And then the final volume, mitigation resources, one of the big 
chunks of that is uh, discussing a bit how this process came about, the meetings, who was there, and, and all that sort of thing. I think I think for for your interest, the basic plan and the Lincoln City uh, addendum are probably the most interesting. That's my guess. Um, The process, I want to talk a bit about the risk assessment. Um, the, the process, the first step is conducting a risk, risk assessment. And that's, uh, this is a mathematical, there's an algorithm associated with this, but the first step is what are the hazards? So, for example, it would be different in eastern Oregon than here. Like we don't have the wildfire fire issue, they don't have the earthquake tsunami issue. Etc. So, depending on where you are, the the ranking of these differs. But the first step is to identify the hazards. What's the probability that that they will occur? What's the the severity? And then on the other side, are we vulnerable? How vulnerable are we to that to that uh, occurrence? In other words, if we felt that an earthquake of a certain level was a serious hazard, but we were convinced that every building was uh, was had seismic standards that would withstand it, even though that was a very serious hazard, we would have a low vulnerability. I'm not saying that's the case, but um, just as an example. So, with that algorithm, windstorms are our highest risk. Risk being defined as the intersection of the hazard and the vulnerability. Because we know they're, go they're going to happen. That's a 100% pretty much that we'll have serious windstorms. Even though the vulnerability is lower, you know, the math, the higher probability makes that, you know, a higher, um, a higher risk, as it were. I mean, the earthquake tsunami risks are, are high, but I'm just saying, just to give an example there. It, so it depends on how likely it is to happen and what will happen when it happens. And we're trying to lower, we don't have any control over the first part. It's going to happen if it happens, or in general, we don't have very much control over that. Maybe wildfires fires might be different, but vulnerability we do, and that's what the natural hazard mitigation part is for? How can we reduce our vulnerability to whatever the hazard is? Um, so risk assessment, gap analysis, where are the issues? Um, adopt a plan, but the, you know, the plan includes what are the strategic activity or the strategic areas, strategic areas, excuse me, um, that we need to deal with. And then the idea being those would be broken down into specific activities. The final step is implementing those. And that may not have happen at one or will not happen at one time, but may be factored in over a period of time. And then plan maintenance. And as I said, every five years, we need to revisit, which is true for, for most plans. One of the things we want to stress moving forward that maybe we haven't done as much in the past, not just us, everyone, is a whole community planning process where we get more involvement the citizens, more involvement with uh, elected officials, just more involvement, basically, in these planning stages. So even though we have a plan here, we can modify this anytime we want. It's our plan, the Lincoln City Addendum. So I think as we focus more on this over the coming, we will probably add some aspects to it, like maybe, for example, around the ADA would be a, a good example. I'm, we identified 24 activities. They're kind of in the, in the Lincoln City Addendum portion, portion of this. Um, some of these were identified earlier. Uh, some we identified just in the recent process. And I just picked out a couple just to kind of get a, a, give a sense of 
the ones that we identified that were not in the previous versions, and <clears throat> they're not necessarily easy fixes. They're not things that we can say, oh, great, we get a contract and we go do this work. They may be a bit more involved, and, and they may require, or will require probably, some real prioritization and discussions about what our what are our ex expectations? And you'll see when I talk about a couple of these. Um, so I picked six that seem to fit that bill uh, to me. One is we, and these are not priorities, these numbers, they're just, it's just the way they came out in the process. But the first is our police station is right at the edge of the, of the if you look at the inundation maps, the police station is right there. It's probably not a good place for a police station. Plus, we don't think it'll withstand really the seismic. Uh, it might, might not, but it's vulnerable. Let's say that. This plan is not, I, I, I abbreviated here. This plan does not say go relocate. It's, it's, uh, it would say study this and figure out what to do about it. So. Take it that way. In other words, we're not really uh, making a commitment that we're that we're going to relocate it. And by relocate, I don't necessarily mean um, move it to a different spot. But it does need to withstand uh, seismic threat and inundation. Uh, Color City, Color City, as we know, is vulnerable. We currently have an assembly area up the hill. It's not quite high enough. It's it's right at the it's right at the border, let me, let me say that. So can we do something else? In some areas, they've, they've, uh, they've got funding for developing safe havens, which might be working with the federal government to do something uh, different. It's, again, it's a discussion. Is there more we can do? And then how do we pursue it? So it's a broad, a broad uh, issue. Uh, community outreach, that's just an, that's an ongoing process, but there's a few specific things. Um, there's a lot of uh, Oregon Emergency manage, Management is doing a lot of work on wayfinding, improving signage for evacuation routes, looking at creative ways to make sure these things work at 3 in the morning when there's no lights, power's out. How do you find, how do you read the signs? and there's a lot of activity going into those areas. So I think as we move forward, it's not just a question of knowing where the route should be, but how do we use it uh, in the middle of the night. Next year, there's a big exercise, Cascadia Rising exercise, 2016, June. This is a big FEMA, OEM uh, f uh, exercise, and I, let me see. I should know this, but I can. Anyway, it's it's going to be multiple days, at least four, but I think even even longer than that. It's a big thing. Then the National Guard will will have a segment, so we will be involved in that. But um, but with respect to outreach, this will this next year will be a good opportunity. There will, there will be. Press coverage. There, I mean, we've already had the New Yorker article, but this will be uh, this will be in the news because of these activities. So it's a good time to to maybe conduct as many outreach events as we can and to get people on board while it's in the air, as it were, and people are thinking about it. Because as you can probably imagine, these things come and they go and. People get complacent, and this should be a year of uh, low complacency, I guess, if I were to call it that. Um, we've talked about, this is again, research this, see if it makes sense, look at what other communities are doing. Um, most of you, I, I hope all of you are familiar with the caches that have been put in Ocean Lake and Taft schools. And the idea is these were outfitted to uh, to provide supplies and water, basically, for the number of students that are likely to be in those schools. But if the school is not in se session, they're public resources, and they're in uh, containers. That's one model. 
The question is, should we do more of that around town? If so, in what form? Different places do it differently. Cannon Beach has, uh, has a system that's kind of individually, where they provide the infrastructure, I guess you'd say, and people uh, people fill 55 gallon drums with with their personal items. Anyway, there's there's a lot of different ways that could happen. It's more of a philosophical thing. To what extent do we go there? It's a big thing. It's a big deal, right? It's not. People always ask, "How are you going to feed, you know, X number of people when this happens?" And I mean, you, no one's prepared to do that. So, but. We can make a dent. How would we do that, and what should we do? So that's what the what the caches are. Um, related to that, we're going to have a lot of tourists here. So how do we handle that? The caches, that sort of thing's part of it, but also education. Oregon Emergency Management is doing a hospitality program. They're just starting this in in November to train people in the hotel industry so that they know what to do, because that's a key part. Do they know what to do so they can help their, you know, the people that are staying with them? And increasing awareness of tourists. Maybe it's by signage in the rooms, maybe it's explicit uh, mailings without scaring people off. This is one of the things people talk about, will we scare off all our tourists? And I mean, the reality is, we're a lot better off in some places. So I think, I don't think we lose in that discussion is my, is my view. And uh, I think people will start to feel comfortable thinking they're going to a community that's working to prepare for, for their needs in case of a disaster. I, I really don't think it's a, it's a negative if handled correctly. I'm not saying we, we try to scare people. And the last thing uh, here is integrate, this is just to indicate the linkages, integrate the, the natural hazard mitigation plan or the information into the comprehensive plan. And this is already a, a requirement, there's nothing new here, but just to indicate that these things start to cut across um, and link together. This just gives a summary of what's happened. 2009, the, uh, the initial plan was adopted. Since 2014, work on the revised plan with some fits and starts has, has been ongoing. FEMA has to approve this plan, which they did in July, August, um, as did Oregon Emergency Management. The Lincoln County Commission adopted the plan, I think, early September, maybe the first their first meeting. Um, the planning, the Lincoln City Planning Commission reviewed this a couple weeks ago, and and they voted to uh, their involvement. If you're wondering, is largely because of that comprehensive plan. It is. It does start to dovetail into uh, land use uh, if taken seriously, um, and they voted to forward a. Uh, a letter um, recommending adoption by the council, and again, we're not here tonight to do that. But that was that was voted on during that planning commission. Uh, tonight, we're discussing, and then we plan, and uh, ideally in an October meeting to uh, have further discussion if need be, but to to have you adopt the plan. And I think I'll stop if you don't mind. <laughs> well, that was a lot. Um, quick question, if I might. Um, the solid waste disposal. Mm. It's been dovetailed with that, too? The Yeah, and especially the debris management plans, yes. Okay. And, but that's a good example of where... You know, we want to rather than having these little pockets of things that are that are flailing. There's some number of these that, that are required by who required somewhere, federal, state, um, and they just sit in their little silo. And the idea would be if if it's if it's important enough to put in a plan, how how should these things be hooked together? So debris management is a critical part. Right. 
of especially recovery, but not just that, even response. Responders need to get out to places and they can't do it if there's trees and houses in the way. So, yes. And then from us, you need? Um, tonight, we're just here to discuss. Okay. I guess I have one. Mm -hmm. um, I was reading through this. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> um, I guess my question is, now, what do you guys figure, like, for a full Cascadian event? Uh, I, on our hotel, I've always been told it's uh, above the, the flood zone mm -hmm. uh, or the, you know, the tsunami level. And I think I'm at 78 feet or something or 80. And then I read in articles that uh, we should expect over 100 feet. Uh, where, where does our community sit with that? Are we all in the subduction zone if we're uh, if it's a hundred foot? Uh, tsunami? Well, it's it's the older maps. I think when they first did maps in the in the nineties, uh, they they sort of used a contour level, you know, like fifty feet, eighty feet, whatever they whatever they used, and kind of said everything below this is okay and above this. The current maps, the current inundation maps that we have, you know, with the yellow and the orange, the, the orange um, uh, along the coast being the distant tsunami, worst case, and the yellow that, that goes in and out being the inundation uh, level for the worst case, I mean, what they think is the worst case, uh, tsunami. So if you look at that, there's no one level. This is a sophisticated model. It, 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 uh, it would be quite different in an area where, where there's a river or a body of water, you know, moving up. Like I think, uh, for example, around the lake, it's really relatively low, and they, they were a bit surprised that they're, uh, that that's what the model showed, just because the water can disperse. Whereas if it's a very narrow canyon, the height could be 100 feet. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So you can't just kind of latch onto a number. Um, those maps, I think, are the best, uh, the, the best resource because a lot of sophisticated thought went into that. The best uh, scientists, you know, put together their model, and they obviously are comfortable enough with it that. You know, we all use it, so it could vary. Yeah. If that's yeah, a good enough cop out. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's you know, when you envision that, that's kind of the, the the thing. It's like a shark. I mean, it really gets your attention. This gigantic wave and everything. But yeah. in reality, what will probably get us is the drought. You know, coming up. How are they? How are they doing that? How, how's that going? I, I was reading some about that, but. What's your feeling on that as far as water supply? The uh, drought? Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm sure Lila and Stephanie are back there if they want to address water supply. I don't, I'm reluctant to get into that. But, but I mean, it's a, it's, there's definitely a concern. I mean, we're, I, you know, those, mo those models, I, it's, it's hard to predict what's going to happen in this area. At least our water source is not dependent on snow melt. No, because I think those areas are, are especially critical because the low snow years are, are a distinct possibility. Um, but I just went to a conference. They talked about this year, the El Nino and all that, and it sounds to me like they're thinking half the winter might be normal or you know, relatively wet and the last half might be drier, but that's one year. But I think, you know, that's part of the reason that we've that we've got other we've tapped into other water sources like the agreement a few years ago for Drift Creek, um, you know, is is to try to provide some diversity of source. So even if, if one area goes down, we've got some alternatives. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a huge task, and this seems to be a well-thought-out mitigation plan prepared by a diverse and well-qualified set of partners. And I'm pleased to see that we're attempting to prepare for potential future natural hazards 
with the intention of minimizing damage and suffering, do the best we can. Thank you for your uh, involvement. You bet. Well, that's what we hope for. Yes, thank you so much. I, I, you know, I've been involved in a small part with the, the waste management part, um, and the debris removal part, and just it, it's so such a small part of this that it, it's o was overwhelming just to try to understand it. Uh, you know, um, I think Jenny uh, Damaris had said it best that you know that the first two days we're just going to be wondering where our loved ones are, uh, yeah. and and, and uh, try to. You know, deal with this on top of that is Herculean, but it's nice that there's a plan sort of and <laughs> being formulated, and hopefully we can get to it and get the right people in place as soon as possible. So I thank you for all your hard work on this. Yeah. And one of the things, just to, to put in, one of the things we're hoping to do uh, is get you more involved in this as we move forward. I, I just attended a conference. I'll just put in a plug for Doug Hunt, the county commissioner, was there and. Um, and I know he's been to a, a number of these things, so I would encourage all of you to consider that as well. What is your phone number, Mark? My phone number? Office phone. 541 921 5286. 5286. Mm -hmm. Office hours? Uh, yeah, that's harder. Um, I work, I work point six time. So what I, what I, I don't know. What I tend to do is come in like half a day most days. I can call you. If it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. That number reaches me. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, um, Mr. Nicholson, I have a, a few little issues with some of the Lincoln City addendum. Um, the cultural and historic resources, critical facilities, and infrastructure um, need some updating. Probably. Yeah. There's some some things listed that I think are out of our jurisdiction, and then there's it says there's one public elementary school, and we have two. Yeah, those are the kind of things. If you if we can. You can communicate that somehow, either when you talk about it or by email. I mean, there there probably are a number of those things. After you look at these things a while, it's kind of hard to look at them right. and carefully. And probably was all um, current at one point. But yeah, well, that's the thing with these plans that get revised, and we you know we try to catch those things, but you know, it's. It's easy to gloss over them when <laughs> right. I say that. Right. So Sorry. I think more eyes are always appreciated. <laughs> so, yeah, anything like that. Uh, and it doesn't have to be something that's incorrect. You know, we also, uh, you know, want to want to think about are there big missing or big areas that or should we think should be there that aren't? Then we can have the discussion maybe why they're not or or we include them. It's a dynamic living plan. That's, that's the idea. Great. Anyone else? No? Thank you very okay. much. Appreciate it. All right. We are at presentation, Community Center Summer Report. Oh, okay. Yeah. Good evening, Mayor Williams and Council. Every year about this time, I usually do a report of a summer wrap-up of activities at the community center, comparing year over to year, year over year, and some trends in the recreation department. So this is, of course, for summer 2015, which just wrapped up um, over Labor Day weekend. We had an extra week this year, which was unusual because Labor Day was later. Um, one thing I'm really proud of with our recreation department is that we have something for everyone, um, no matter what age, what culture, what background, what act interest or activity. Um, we try to offer um, something to keep people busy and active and healthy. Our revenue this year was 
outstanding. Um, and most of it was due to a large number of drop-ins um, that came, paid the day use fee. We were about 16% up year over year from last year. Our community center revenue includes drop-in fees, membership fees, swim lessons, room rentals, and concessions. We track recreation revenue, which is for activities and sporting events separately, and we also track our rec kids and the summer camp program revenue separately as well. So year over year, membership sales increased 13%, but de the renewals decreased by 7%. Um, so total, we were up 7%. Our member usage was up 1.3%. Drop-ins, this is where we really had a good summer. Um, swim, swimming was up 7%, fitness up 9% for a total of 7% year over year. Our community center revenue um, up 16%. Our special recreation was down 17%, as summer camp was down 11% as well. And these two items were down mostly, I think, due to competition from other programs going on in the area. There are several other summer camps, and there are more youth activities now, from the Cultural Center to the Library, Nesquen Valley School, B'nai B'rith Camp. Um, so there's a lot more choices for parents to make for their children, um, which is a good thing. Um, but it also means we need to be on our toes and come up with new activities to capture some of that revenue back. Um, member usage, and this is the three months of summer, um, was 18,400 and change. And you can see that most of the people, most of the members who use the community center are in the senior category, which means age 62 and older. Um, the next highest are adults, followed by youth, and then household memberships. Drop-in usage was excellent. Um, almost 5,000 kids came and swam in our pool over the summer, and that's pretty darn good. Um, so our total swim numbers, 7,500, and total fitness num numbers were around 2,000. And then the rock wall, almost 300 people climbed the rock wall for the summer. So if you average it out, members plus drop-ins, it's almost 300 people a day through our doors, and that's just for community center activities. That doesn't include Meals on Wheels or the um, Senior Center. Swim lessons, um, total enrollment was almost 300 this summer. Our biggest growth was seen among private lessons um, this summer. Level one is always very popular. That's the one that takes place in the small pool where you learn to blow bubbles and float on your back and get your ears wet. Um, level two is the one that kids have to repeat several times because in order to pass that, they have to be able to do some semblance of a crawl stroke, which is a lot to learn. Um, swim lessons start at age four, and so when you're four or five years old, that's a lot of coordination going on. And then... Kids tend to trend out of the swim lessons and into swim team the higher up they go, um, lessons four, or levels four and five. Comparatively, our numbers did really well this summer. Um, you can see the anomaly was 2012, which was a, an Olympic year uh, for Summer Olympics. So I'm anticipating next year, in 2016, we'll see another spike in swim lessons. Um, when youngsters see people like Michael Phelps swimming, they want to swim like that, so their parents enroll them in swim lessons. Again, you can see the growth in private swim lessons the last couple of years. And a lot of this is due to, I'm going to back up here, uh, Colin Perkins, who is our aquatic lead, just a stellar instructor who connects very well with children and adults. He can break down any type of swimming you want to know about into doable parts. Um, he works with some of our staff to strengthen their skills, including our lifeguards and our other swim instructors. And then he works down to um, um, all the way to disabled youngsters and um, preschoolers. Just a very talented and gifted instructor, so real glad to have him on board. Um, we have a small concessions. Um, 
we sell, of course, one-use showers. People will come in who are camping or who are getting their water heater fixed. They'll come in for a shower. Um, we don't have a ping pong table anymore because it was broken by some youth many years ago. But we have a machine that dispenses ping pong balls. Go figure, they still buy them. Um, swim diapers, noodle rentals, the basic swim caps. We started selling flip flops this year, not only for more attraction in the showers, but for more sanitation. $5 for flip flops, you can't beat it. Um, so that generates a little bit of revenue for us too. In addition to our regular swim lessons and other events, we had some special events. The biggest um, is Touch a Truck, um, which is in our parking lot. Um, I can't say enough about the local vendors who participate, everyone from Public Works in Lincoln City to Pacific Power to the Lincoln City Police, um, North Lincoln Sanitary, PacWest Ambulance, um, smiles everywhere, children and adults, so just a great event. Um, we had Kids Free Fishing, which was, again, a huge success. Um, more than 300 children were catching fish in the uh, trout pond at the Salmon River Fish Hatchery. But you probably saw in the paper the future of the hatchery is unsure at this point. They're saying it's not closing, but I know that most of the ponds are going to be empty most of the year, so I don't know what that's going to do to this program next year. Um, I'll have to talk to them and see if we can arrange something. Our summer youth activities, um, outdoor soccer numbers were up. Last year we had around 120 youngsters enrolled and this program is for children ages 4 through 13. Um, they play every Saturday through October at Boris Field at Taft High School and they practice in the old Taft Elementary Field, um, the old um, where the school grounds were. Basketball camps, summer camp numbers were down some. Uh, again, I think the competition from other activities around town, plus I heard comments that um, these camps were just for a few hours and it was difficult for parents to get their children to and from the camp for just a few hours, especially if you're a working parent. So we might need to reassess how we run those programs to make them more inviting and accessible for other children. Wild Wednesdays was a new program. We partnered with Ian Keene from the um, Open Space Department, and um, attendance wasn't as great as I had hoped. He took youngsters out and showed them survival skills, mostly on the villages at Cascade Head property. And um, I know the children who came returned for all of the, the days, so those who came found it a success, and we'll work on building that program next summer. Our trekking summer day camp numbers were about par, um, just a little under last year. Um, this camp is for children ages 5 through 11. We had just over 100 children, unique children enrolled. Most of them attended multiple times, but those were the individual enrollees. Our average daily attendance was 27. Um, this is just a great program. They came to City Hall. They met with the police chief. They would go to the library. They go to the Regatta Park, the lake, the park. Um, and the goal is to keep children's active, happy. Um, they learn it's a good thing to be nice to others. And you know what more can you ask for? And we transitioned immediately into our after-school program once school started. So that is now operating a 3 to 6 p.m. every day after school at Ocean Lake School. And even if with the new school configurations, um, different grades at different schools, we do bus in between the schools. So children who go to Taft can also attend the program at Ocean Lake. Uh, we had the Ocean's Edge 5K, um, which is always one of our favorite events. It's a low-key running event, open and inviting um, families, friends, pets, strollers, you name it, they hit the beach and uh, they do 3.1 miles. The winner this year was Eric Johnson from the v Visitor and Convention Bureau. That was pretty exciting. He won a glass float, which is ironic, but he was thrilled. <laughs> um, behind him was um, Chester, or Ch Chet Gardner, who was a graduate of Taft High School, uh, now lives out of town, but returns every year to come to this race. And that's what I love about the event is it brings in new faces, old faces return, and then we also get a lot of visitors. The Lincoln City Sprint Triathlon, you probably know, was canceled due to lack of registration numbers. A couple of things have hurt us. Lack of use of the lake because of the ongoing blue-green algae problem. 
And then also there are some for-profit events going on elsewhere in the state around the same time that we traditionally held the triathlon. So we decided to cancel this year. We're regrouping, looking at other opportunities, um, other events that we might hold, or perhaps ways to partner with those for-profit companies and bring a bigger event here. But we did have a couple of local people registered to do the race, and one was a team with a 92-year-old and a 77-year-old. They were so disappointed we weren't going to have the race that we had an unofficial event last week. So they came and Frank King on the left swam the 500 meters and Calvin on the right biked around the lake and ran the 5K. I went along with him to make sure he didn't get lost. And so we had some leftover medals and t-shirts and they were awarded medals and t-shirts for their efforts. So. It was pretty darn cool, really inspirational to the customers who happened to be at the community center at that point in time. And believe me, these gentlemen, gentlemen were thrilled that they did it. So now it's fall. Um, we have cross country taking place. Um, I'm the coach, and the team has grown since this, pic since this picture. I have a record 16 middle schoolers on my team. Um, this was one of our first meets up at uh, the Hydrangea Ranch north of Tillamook where there's a huge mud pit on the Kilchis River that they run through, and not everyone likes it, you can tell. <laughs> um, we also have some new equipment um, that just came in, including these two Cybex trainers. They're kind of like a pre-core, but they're more forgiving for your knees and hips, and customers are raving about them already. Other things we have going on this fall are... Um, Volleyball, indoor soccer, basketball's right around the corner. The Rec Kids After Program, After School Program, as I mentioned, started. Our Fall Free For All, which is a great big water fight, will take place in the pool on October 23rd. Um, I'll be attending the Oregon Recreation and Parks Association Conference. Um, and as an aside, the theme of that conference this year is inclusion and diversity. So I think it works real well with what we're doing here in the city in terms of inclusion for everyone. Um, fall swim lessons start in November. The Lincoln City Swim Club will hold their pumpkin sprint meet in November. And then we look forward to our Jingle Bell Jog 5K. Usually it's on the stormiest Saturday in December, but we hold it in a way. Um, at after the picnic, we hosted the children's games at Curtis Park along with the um, hot dog feed and just had a great time. In addition to traditional sack races and noodle races and tug of war, we gave away 100 bottles of bubbles. Had a great time. Our pool closure um, was today, started today. We um, pulled the plug this morning. Um, we had the dog swim last night. We had about 50 pooches there and they had a great time. No kerfuffles or anything major. Um, these were pictures from last night. Um, big dogs, little dogs. The largest was an English Mastiff, 170 pounds. He was not quite happy with the water. And then we had a little terrier that was just terrorizing everybody else in the big pool. Um, so the pool was about two-thirds drained by the time I came here. So um, they're already working on cleaning, painting, shining, scrubbing. Um, we're going to be acid washing, regrouting, and replacing the tiles in the pool, servicing the chlorine injectors, the boiler and the heat exchanger, which we do once, once a year, repairing and rebuilding the main pool filters, um, and then, of course, the light project will be getting underway soon as well. So it's all hands on deck. Bring your scrub brush for the pool closure. And so, of course, as we get into fall and winter, we'll be continuing our marketing. Um, we have 1,400 Facebook likes. Um, interestingly, more women than men. And the most popular age group for women is in 35 to 44 age group category. And the men are younger, so I guess it's the up-and-coming millennials, I think they're called, 25 to 34-year-olds. Check out the Facebook page. Um, we also post on Twitter, probably not as much as I should, but I'm learning. And then we do our traditional marketing methods, the fall fun guide, hotel guides, restaurant menus, school, homework folders, which go home with every child in school um, for their homework every day. We have an ad on those folders. Uh, radio, newspaper, internet news services, um, 
you name it, I try to be out there. So that's it for the summer. Are there any questions? You mentioned pulling the plug, Gail. In the past, I recall that there was some danger of the pool floating as a result of lack of water in the pool? Yes. Is that um, still an issue? That is, will always be an issue since the pool was built in a big swamp. Um, so last, beginning last Thursday, we started draining the groundwater from around the pool. And we will continue to dra drain the groundwater until the pool is empty and then we actually do pull the literal plug and then the static pressure between the groundwater and the pool will keep mm -hmm. the pool in the ground. But we monitor that very closely. Um, today was probably the most stressful day of the year for my aquatic supervisor as he was keeping the groundwater going and the pool emptying at the same time. So we still have groundwater in spite of the dry, dry summer? In spite of the drought, yes, it's still there. Yeah. Well, that's encouraging. It is. And I sent out a press release last week to newspapers and radio just to let customers know when they see the water flowing in our parking lot, they go, oh, you're draining the pool already. It's like, no, it's just the groundwater. And will you need to close the pool when you do the light project? Pardon? Will you need to close the pool when you do the light project? Yes. Yes. We're waiting on the contractor and the materials. Hope to get that soon and get it underway. Will that be a week? Two weeks? Any idea? I am talked to Energy Trust last week because we are getting a nice rebate from them for this upgrade, and I'll be talking to the contractor. I've been in contact with the contractor waiting for a definitive word from him when that will be, hopefully soon. And how long will it take? Any idea? He anticipates about a week for the pool and another week for the gymnasium. Thank you. How are your staffing levels? Right now, the only position we have open is the recreation supervisor. Um, Carl, who was pictured a few slides back playing basketball with the children, left us to go work for Lincoln County School District. Um, so we have advertised and we received quite a few very good applicants for the position. We will be interviewing next week for that position. That's good news. So it is. It is, especially with basketball season right around the corner. I'm getting a little nervous. Hope to get it filled soon. You had enough help over this? Yes, we did. Perfect. Yes. Great help. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very Good much. Good job as usual. Thank you. Well, and thank you for su your support of recreation in Lincoln City. Um, love to show off the community center and um, talk about the support we receive from the council. So thank you. All right. All right. We are at Capital Purchases Computer Network Systems Upgrade. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I don't know that I've actually formally introduced uh, our IT manager in, in a public forum, um, so I'm very pleased to introduce Tony LaSoya. He's been here, I noticed, uh, the other day, just six months, about Friday, I think. <laughs> and um, Tony's just done a really great job his first six months here, learning our current environment and doing a needs assessment. And he has put a plan together that is taking care of several key issues that we have in IT that I have been wanting to take care of for several years and I just didn't know how to get there. So I'm really super excited about it and he's also going to give you an update on the speakers. Yeah, I'm going to lead with the audio system because I know it's been a thorn <laughs> in you folks' side um, for some time. We have a plan, uh, we have a vendor and uh, we're going to start the week of October 12th and do um, work uh, when there's no meetings in here, so we don't have to reschedule or move anybody. Um, hopefully by the end of the week of November 2nd, uh, you'll be speaking into new microphones um, that will pick up your voice and will work properly. Um, we have, uh, we're contracting with a vendor out of Newport uh, who did the work uh, for the Celeste Tribe. We went out and looked at their equipment based on your recommendations. Um, it's very nice equipment. He does very good work. And we trust that um, the system will be robust for many years to come. 
So I appreciate your um, patience as we work through this. I know it has been painful. Um, I believe that what we are going to deploy is going to um, solve the problem. So there's an update on the audio system. And um, so much thanks to Bill Wyman, um, who you guys all know. Um, he's been doing a fine job of um, working with the vendors and uh, crafting a solution for us. So I'm excited about that. And, and uh, it'll have mute buttons, really cool stuff. Um, so I'm here tonight to respectfully ask for your approval to spend um, funds that have already been allocated by the Budget Committee um, to upgrade our um, information technology infrastructure. Um, we find ourselves in a position where um, our current network operating system, Novell, is um, losing market share and at some point will become obsolete and no longer supported. I think we're one of the last municipalities in the state of Oregon um, that is using Novell. It's expensive. Um, we don't have a lot of on-site expertise, so we've relied on an expensive contractor to help us. And um, it is time to move to a more industry standard solution, uh, which is uh, Microsoft. And with this project will come new hardware um, that will allow us to have um, high availability. It will meet the needs of the EOC project uh, with failover. Um, this project will um, make it so if this building becomes uninhabitable, we can spin up at the EOC. Um, it will give us the ability to um, manage uh, documents properly um, based on the state requirements, including email retention. Um, and it will also reduce the footprint in the data center, which will reduce, um, reduce electricity costs. Um, it's a win all the way across the board. Um, the budget was approved at $143,000, uh, requesting about $120,000, as you'll see in the packet. Um, we're looking at about a five-year return on investment because this project is going to allow us to reduced ongoing maintenance fees by about $25,000 a year. So this project will pay for itself. Um, I'm hoping that with the phone system project that's coming up, we'll find a way to save even more money. Um, and, uh, if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. I was tickled to see that you're going to have Outlook for, <laughs> for mail I think instead a lot of that people thing we've got now. <laughs> Yeah, GroupWise will, um, group will be decommissioned and we're moving to Microsoft Exchange and Outlook for the client. Um, all of your email will be preserved and moved along um, with the project. And so That's good. I'm glad to hear that you're happy to hear that. It's, that is the industry standard. Um, and uh, so. Tony, in your memo, your project description, letter D, Talks about virtualization. Yes, sir. What what does that refer to? Um, virtualization is the ability to run multiple server hosts on one piece of hardware. So in the past, where you would have a server, which is a fancy name for a powerful computer. So you have a powerful computer um, that is running a single application. You are now tied that application to one piece of hardware and all of the resources that it consumes, power, uh, disk space. Most computers do not run at 100%. Most of them run at 3 to 5% at any given time. A highly utilized computer in this kind of environment will run at 10 to 15%. What virtualization does, it allows you to run multiple versions of the operating system, multiple virtual computers on one piece of hardware. So you'll have one server running your GIS server, running your um, directory server, your email server, will all run on one physical piece of hardware in multiple hosts, multiple operating systems. Um, it, is, uh, it is efficient. Um, it reduces the number of servers you have to run in your data center. It reduces the cooling costs. It reduces the electricity costs. Uh, and it also allows for high availability because you will build it in, in if you look at the quote, you'll see four servers. These servers will fail over in the event that one of them physically um, fails. It'll fail over to another physical server. 
Um, the idea is that you have 99.999% uptime. Um, these servers, um, it's called high availability. So that's what virtualization gives you. It also gives you the ability to take a snapshot of the data and recover within a 15 minute window. So if you uh, delete a file within 15 minutes, you should be able to recover that file. So it's taking snapshots throughout the day. Um, it's, so that's what high availability, virtualization is part of high availability. And how about WSCA pricing? Uh, WSCA pricing is a negotiated contract um, between many of the states and many of the vendors. So the pricing is already negotiated. Um, so it, it, I think, removes the necessity for us to go out to bid. Um, so, which I did go out and get multiple bids from other vendors, though, just to cover ourselves, to make sure that we we're um, doing the right thing. And Dell came in um, well below the other vendors that um, I spoke with. But the Whisker contract, I, I believe, is, a, is like a cons buying consortium of, in, of uh, colleges, uh, municipalities, states, and they negotiate these prices. So. And I'm very glad to see that we are $20,000 under the budget, in addition to saving $25,000 every year. Yeah, it's a win, and I'm really excited about it. Nice job. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, and I'm also happy to see that we will have a complete redundant system off-premise, which yes, I sir. think is something we really have needed, seriously. That in and of itself is, is worth, it makes this project worthwhile, I think. You bet. Um, it's, it's just phenomenal. Yeah, just, if this place crumbles exciting. and it all yeah. goes with, at least it's somewhere else. Yeah. Tony, did I hear you mention phone systems? Yes, sir. We're going to replace the phones? Uh, yes, sir. Um, next year, we're going to look at uh, replacing an end-of-life phone system. So the Nortel that we have um, is end-of-life. It is no longer supported, and we need to look at what we're going to do for a replacement. And, and several of those options um, are significantly less expensive than what we're currently paying for phones. And that wasn't part of this, though. No, sir. Okay. Mr. Mayor, if, if I might clarify that just a little bit, we will be presenting to you and the budget committee a proposal to replace our phone system. So it's not something that's been approved, but it will be a proposal as part of next year's budget. Correct. Yeah. Your, your Honor, sure. just for the record, because um, I don't see it in the staff report, the uh, uh, a uh, contract for the purchase of computer equipment and software is uh, under one of the listed specific exemptions in Chapter 205.080. It's a Paragraph C. It, it does allow, uh, again, it's an exemption, so you're basically approving an exemption to competitive bidding. Um, it does require that you obtain competitive quotes, so it's good that you did that. Um, and just as well as it's documented for the record, um, you are also proving an exemption from competitive bidding under that section. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? We're looking for a motion to approve, huh? I move that we spend the project cost of $120,573 to uh, change our IT system. I second it. Motion to second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Williams? Yes. Norakis? Yes. Sprague? Yes. Walkie? Yes. And Ward? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. You. Good job. Excellent presentation. Thank you. All right. Uh, city Manager, City Attorney reports. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I have two items to bring before you tonight. The first pertains to the um, procedures for uh, replacing our former counselor, Jim Davis. Uh, previously, you had uh, determined that you would um, uh, re replace him through an appointment, uh, uh, through an appointment. Our um, charter, our ordinances, um, uh, deal with the, the method, but they're silent as to the process uh, for that appointment. So what I'm bringing before you tonight is a, is a recommendation and a proposal on how to replace them or how to go about the process of replacing them under the appointed method of doing so. So the uh, applications 
um, have the date for receiving applications is closed. We do have some applicants that will come before you. Our recommendation is that you conduct your interviews with them at your next council meeting, on uh, at your right next regularly scheduled council meeting on October 12th, and that you do it through an interview process. That interview process would be a public process, which means it would be done in the open meeting. Uh, we, uh, what we're uh, suggesting is that between now and Friday, that each of you submit uh, one or two questions that you would like uh, to ask so that uh, each candidate is given the opportunity to uh, be asked the same kind of questions. Uh, will the staff, will, mm -hmm. Kathy and I will take those, we'll put them together into a, into a form that then you can uh, rotate those questions. Uh, in as much as one of the questions that we, uh, that we asked ourselves was can you sequester or can you ask the candidates that are not being interviewed at the, at the mo moment to wait in another room uh, until after? And the answer to that question is no. Uh, it's a public meeting. Uh, all candidates are uh, eligible to sit in the room even if, even if they're the last one uh, uh, being interviewed. So what we're recommending that you do is that you bring all three of the candidates up to the, uh, up to the, the desk and that you, um, you ask one question, beginning with the first one, they each have a chance to respond to that, then you ask the next question beginning with the second candidate and then they each respond to it and so forth. So you rotate through the questions so that uh, one individual candidate doesn't have the opportunity to hear all of the questions you're gonna ask before, uh, before they interview. Uh, we actually thought about doing the dating game and uh, having them sitting behind a, uh, a panel where you can't see them and just identify them as candidates A, B, and C, and then you can ask them the questions like the old dating game, but we decided that may not be quite the way to do that. <laughs> following the uh, following the questions, then we're proposing that you uh, that you cast ballots. Uh, Kathy will have prepared uh, the, the the ballots that then she will you will give them to her. She will read um, the the winners of the ballots. Uh, if there is a if there is someone who is a winner, then of course you ultimately have to prove that through a motion. If there is a tie, then of course you can do the balloting again until you are ready to make a motion and select your uh, next council member. So that is the procedure that we're recommending uh, that you follow as as, uh, as you look to appoint a new city council member. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Uh, why two questions? I mean, these are it's a pretty big commitment, and I think the the, um, the applicants would, and the community want more than two questions. Well, if you each submit two questions, that would be ten questions for the candidate. I thought you meant two questions. No, no. Two, uh, what we're asking is uh, a couple from each of you. Okay. And then we'll go through them. If there's any duplicates, we'll ask some more. But if, if you go through ten questions, that could be a very long uh, interview process. So it, it's, it's a couple of questions from each of you. So uh, different candidates, I mean, it's a small town, so different candidates are going to have different perceived strengths or challenges. Uh, are we going to be able to ask a candidate ab about those specifically? So, for example, if we had a young candidate, if we had one, uh, you know, a fair question might be, do you think you have enough experience? And uh, um, you wouldn't necessarily ask that same question from us a season pro that uh, we try to follow this as closely as we as we do for interviewing for positions which means you need to ask the same questions of each person however having said that as I've read through the information on the um, on the procedures for uh, appointing um, uh, city council members, I could not find anything that would say if there was a question that came up that you wanted to ask specifically of a candidate that you would be prohibited from doing that. But we generally try to follow the same procedures we would for hiring a new employee, which means that you ask each candidate the same questions. But we're not hiring an employee. And that's why there's a little bit more leeway. Yeah. 
Your Honor. Yes. Just um, for clarity, you're each submitting questions to the manager, but essentially you're delegating to the manager the decision of which questions to ask. Because he may, you know, after some consultation, look at it and go, this is probably an inappropriate question, um, so we're going to drop it out. So you are delegating as part of this procedure to the manager to select uh, appropriate questions from the questions that you submit to him. And I yeah. appreciate that. I guess my, my concern is if this were an election, the questions wouldn't be off limits from constituents. They could ask these candidates those questions. They could. And I'm just concerned that we're limiting ourselves to ask as if we're hiring an employee. The, again, uh, the, the process is up to you on how you would, uh, on how you would proceed forward with it. Uh, we looked at uh, we looked at really how we hire an employee and say what are the kind of questions uh, the 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 taboo questions that uh, Mr. Apicello refers to would be things that uh, uh, could get the city in trouble because they would violate some sort of some civil right or some protected class. Those would be the kind of things that we that we would not ask in a regular type of interview. But again. If uh, you begin with some questions, uh, they can, uh, and uh, and your uh, discussions with the council can, or with the potential, with the applicants can take different uh, different routes. There is more leeway than if it were an employee, but you have to begin with something. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, and these the applicants don't enjoy protections that are that are there for employees. They're Um, I would have to look at I would have to look at that and ask that question. Um, in an election, I think our mayor is correct. You can vote based upon how you feel, and it's Tuesday and you feel this way, or it's Wednesday and you feel that way. Um, whether or not you could ask a question that could violate some that in an employee's inter, in an interview for an employee would violate their uh, civil rights or their protected class. I don't know if those are off limits, but I can certainly check and find out on that. Again, this is not an election. It is an interview process, and we're going to make sure we don't ask inappropriate questions as part of this process. All right. Anything else? Uh, no. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I do. One, Mr. Mayor, one other thing. I Mr. Have. Chandler? Yes. You need a motion to approve this suggested process? I believe I do. I would so move that we approve Mr. Chandler's uh, proposal. Second it. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I have a motion in the second session. Kind of with Mr. Ward, I'm a little concerned about that, but I, I understand the limitations we're up against here. Um, so I prefer an election, but that's what we've got. And Mr. Apicello, you'll be re reviewing those for legality. Okay, so we had a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none. Okay. Motion carries. Mr. Mayor, I have one other item. Um, we have several dates that are coming up that pertain to our uh, community development department, and so I've asked Mrs. Nicholson if she would come and just uh, take a moment and, and review those dates with you. Hello again. Okay. Um, we have a big week for planning coming up. We have uh, been involved in a plan for the Nelscott Gap refinement area. And it's um, over 200 acres. It surrounds the new highway improvement that we're just completing in Nelscott. Um, as part of this planning effort, we decided to have a design week. And uh, for design week, which is this week, we have our consultants coming. They are, um, and we also have invited a special guest who is a, an award-winning urban planner, activist, and artist. Um, so um, 
We have actually two things going on. One is the Nilscott plan, um, design week activities. And then we've also um, latched on to that as um, an opportunity to start talking about our long-term vision for the city in a community visioning workshop. And we have two of those on Friday. Um, I'm just, I didn't make a PowerPoint, but I can hold these up and hopefully Charlie can zoom in on them. This is the Nelscott Plan Community Design Week. We're putting a lot of these posters around town. And I would also like to mention that we have a website and a Facebook page. Um, the website is um, nelscottplan.com. And on the Facebook, I believe it's just Nelscott Plan. So if you want to get the details and you haven't seen these posters um, and you don't find it in the newspaper, uh, you can go on the web. I think it'll be in the newspaper. I know Jeremy uh, um, has been talking to me from the news guard and we'll have some information in the Wednesday edition. Um, or you can call the planning department. We can always help you out. Um, on our web page, um, LincolnCity.org. We also have a link to those pages and those schedules. Here is um, another poster that we have up. This is for the two workshops on Friday to talk about our vision for the city, community, um, neighborhoods, and our open spaces. So let me, um, I don't want to bore you, but I want to make sure we all have the information. And we have a lot of events coming up. On Wednesday, from 1 to 5, we have an open invitation uh, for property owners in the project area to stop in to what we are calling an open design studio. We have studio space in the Nelscott Strip. Uh, we've rented a, a vacant space. And uh, so uh, owners can drop by and talk to the architect, Lawrence Kamar, who will be there working on plans and um, talk, uh, available to talk with owners about uh, their property and, uh, and the overall vision for the area. Same Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. Did you say 1 to 5 or That's 3 to 5? 1 o'clock to 5 o'clock on Wednesday. Which is which date? I'm sorry. It's uh, September 30th. September 30th. Okay. There was a lot of them. I got them kind of mixed up. Yeah. I'm sorry. Day after tomorrow. Yeah, right. Uh, so... Um, and, and we will continue that open studio for the next two days on Thursday and Friday. But we also have some specific date, uh, times and dates for meetings. On Wednesday the 30th, the same day, day after tomorrow, from 6.30 to 8.30, we'll have the first open house for this planning effort. And it will be here in the council chambers. Uh, this is an opportunity for the public to view work done to date. Uh, we've, we've already talked about vision, um, goals and objectives, and current conditions, projected uh, conditions for that area. So we're going to have that information available, and the consultants will be on hand to talk with the um, interested participants in the workshop. It's open to the public. That's what it's for. On Thursday from 8 to 2, we have the open studio. Um, drop in to talk to the architect planner, Lawrence Kamar, and share your ideas. Uh, later that afternoon from uh, 3 to 5 o'clock here in the council chambers is a joint meeting of the planning commission and the city council. Uh, this will be your opportunity to receive a briefing on what's been going on, including the open house. Friday's a big day. We have from 8 o'clock to 6 o'clock the open studio. You can drop by again in the Nelscott Strip anytime. Uh, Friday uh, from 9.30 to 11, we are going to be at the high school. And we are taking with us James Rojas, who will be working with the students. He is... Um, from LA, he's really got a different perspective, and he's well known for his work throughout the country. He was just in New York last week, um, trying to draw out um, comments and participation from people who usually don't show up for our meetings or fill out our surveys. And uh, um, in this case, he will be working with the students. I hope he's going to be utilizing some of his hands-on um, activities to draw them out and get them thinking long-term about what they'd like to have in their community. So that's um, 
Friday later in, well, in the day uh, from 3 to 5 p.m., we and we'll also have a second session for those people who are working during those hours. Uh, we'll have a session from 6.30 to 8.30. Both of these are at the community center, the rec center. Uh, we're going to be having community planning workshops with James Rojas. Um, he'll be um, talking again about um, the community vision for um, neighborhoods, for individual homes maybe, for public spaces and the community as a whole. On, on Saturday, October 3rd from 8.30 to 10, James Rojas will be at La Roca Restaurant on the Nelscott Strip. This will be conducted in Spanish. So um, those Spanish speakers out there, uh, I hope you'll turn out for that meeting on Saturday morning at La Roca. Later on, Saturday morning, 10.30 to 1.30, we'll have the second open house. It will be on Scott Plaza in the Nelscott Strip, and it's supposed to be a nice day. Uh, this open house and public workshop will uh, allow the public to see what's been going on during the week and what our designer, Lawrence Kamar, has come up with and um, give their input on how, how they think uh, we did over the week and if they think that uh, any changes are important. Um, and following that, we will have a, a fairly short project advisory committee meeting here in the council chambers. And uh, the project advisory committee will be um, assessing uh, what we've what we've come up with as preferred alternatives and see if they agree or disagree and uh, give us any uh, further input at that time. That's all the all the events. I think I hope I didn't miss anything. Um, it should be a very interesting and fun week. I hope. Uh, I hope everyone will join us. We'll have uh, we'll televise some of these events, um, the like the joint uh, council and commission workshop, and um, that's all I guess I have. Unless you have questions, do you have copies of that schedule, yeah. madam? I think you didn't. You get one at your seats today. If you didn't, we'll send them to you in an email. Yeah. Okay, it was emailed. All right, so. Um, okay. All right. Will, I'm sorry. will any of that be on Channel 4? Yes, well, the um, Joint Commission and Council. Well, I mean, the. the will be? As an ad the, of the dates. Oh, I'm not sure we do that, but if we do, if we can run, put this in the program, we could, we could, I'll helpful. see if we can do that. Get it? Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I think it's pretty exciting. exciting. Yeah, yeah. And get out there and participate. Thank you. All right. Um, anything else, sir? No. Mr. Attorney. I just have the one item, <clears throat> which is uh, at the beginning, uh, earlier in the meeting, I asked that you add to the agenda. Uh, an executive session, um, and that's because we can have an executive session. It can be called during any regular meeting um, that has previously been noticed, and this meeting has been noticed. Um, so I have uh, the script in the Attorney General's manual on, on Exhibit K, page 9. Um, if you'd like to read that or if you'd like me to read it. Feel free. Uh, the Lincoln City City Council will now meet in executive session pursuant to ORS 192-660-2F and 2H. Uh, 2F is to consider confidential records. 2H is current litigation, um, which allows the City Council to meet in executive session to discuss. This is Ross Smith versus Lincoln City Circuit Court case. Representatives of the news media and designated staff shall be allowed to attend the executive session. All other members, well, basically, we're, we're going to leave this room and go to the executive session room. Uh, we're not going to ask everybody to leave this room. Um, representatives of the news media are specifically directed not to report on or otherwise disclose any of the deliberations or anything said about these subjects during the executive session, except to state the general subject of the executive session as previously announced. No decision may be made in executive session. At the end of the executive session, we will return to open session 
and welcome the audience back uh, to the into the room. Obviously, we're we're not going to kick everyone out of this room, but we will return to this room, and then if there's anything else. And I know it's impossible to say, but do you have a time frame? I, I this again is just the litigation update on Ross Smith versus Lincoln City, and I think we only need about ten minutes, and then okay. we should be back. All right. So, do we make a motion for that now? I believe you would. Uh, recess this meeting and reconvene the executive session in the, down the hall in five minutes. All right, so we're going to recess for an executive session and resume here. Yeah, okay. Did you say Yeah, yeah. We can't go on. Did we have a, a motion or was that unanimous consent? Unanimous. computer in here, but I suppose it's okay. Right. I
Okay, Let's go home. Is it okay in there? <laughs> what? Just get a concerned look on your face. You just look, look to me like you want me to. <laughs> <laughs> on record? We're good. Okay, so we're calling back to order. Back on record. So this meeting is say reconvened. reconvened 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 thank you okay um your attorney was that it then for you tonight okay thank you 
And uh, reports from standing committees? None? Yes, I shouldn't do that. Okay. Additional comment from citizens present on uh, non agenda items? Seeing none. Announcement or comments by City Council? Sir? I just want to say that uh, during that last meeting that we had a couple weeks ago, uh, I was planning on coming to the meeting and voting yes to pass that ordinance on the uh, medical marijuana. And I have, I assume that because we had a unanimous vote to go ahead and, and uh, create that ordinance, that the majority of the council probably were set to do the same. But because of the overwhelming and compelling uh, response from those people who spoke, I think it changed my mind, and I think it probably changed everyone else's mind. And that ordinance then did not pass, and we opted to uh, do nothing, which means that uh, the sale of marijuana in uh, the dispensaries uh, is okay. And the, one, the thing I want to say about that is that that shows that uh, democracy works. And I just think it's it's worth uh, noting that. Anyone else? Yes, I'd like to thank Mayor Williams, Councillor Walkie, and City Manager Ron Chandler for attending the League of Oregon Cities Conference in Bend. I'm hoping to get together with one of you to uh, discover what it is you learned. <laughs> also, <laughs> also, I'd like to thank, or, or not thank, but congratulate Ryan Smith, the aquatic supervisor at the community center, who was promoted to the rank of lieutenant with the North Lincoln Fire and Rescue District, I believe is the right term. Well done, Ryan Smith. And I'd like to straight, um, thank the streets department for doing a great job on prior to the parade, getting the cones out there, keeping the traffic moving, getting the cones down. Nice job. Thank you all. Okay. Anyone else? I have a couple items. I just want to say on behalf of the um, Lincoln City Chamber, of Commerce that um, this Saturday is one of our big fundraisers, um, an Arttober Brewfest, which is a, a family-friendly, dog-friendly event um, at the Cultural Center from 11 to 6. Lots of children's activities. Um, there'll be a pet parade, lots of good music, and come taste some beer. Um, the other thing I want to say is that sometimes things I read in the newspaper, I feel are the reporter's view. But when there's something quoted, I take personal offense. And I think that we need to treat each other on the council with respect. And I don't know anyone who knows me who would describe me as lazy. I don't appreciate that comment at all. All right. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>